Welcome to the Elite Performance Podcast with Building Better Athletes. Today, our guest is Corey Van Wyk of Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa. Corey shares with us his current kind of training regimen and how though that has changed from years past to present and some of his biggest influencers in the strength and conditioning field. Corey also shares with us how he tackles his responsibilities of not only being a strength and conditioning coach for many teams, but also being a kinesiology professor in the kinesiology department and some of the unique things he's doing with his classes in that regard. As always, please follow us on Instagram or Twitter at BBA Performance and give us a shout out and core a shout out if you like what you hear today. So without further ado, let's get to Welcome to the Elite Performance Podcast. Today I'm really excited for our guest today. It's Corey Van Wyk. He is a strength and conditioning coach and also a kinesiology professor at Northwestern uh, college out in Orange City, Iowa. Corey, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. How are you? Excellent, man. I'm excited for today and uh, um, got my notepad ready to write a lot of notes down because I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Well, that's good, man. I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and you know, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for asking me to be on. Absolutely. First thing, you know, give a little background of how you got to where you are today because you got a pretty interesting and intensive background of how you got to where you are now. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, my kind of path down getting involved with sports performance or strength and conditioning really started when, uh, after my freshman year in high school. So at the time I was probably my main sport was track. And, uh, we had this, <laughs> we had this guy on our team who was a senior and he was like one of the best runners in the state. You know, he's a 400 runner and he was running a 400 in like 48 seconds yep and he was also the only person in our high school who lifted weights so I kind of looked at him and I thought hey maybe I should do this Uh, so I approached my track coach and I asked him for a lifting program and luckily at the time we had an alum who was at Baylor okay so what he did was he just gave me his summer program and I I think that I was pretty lucky with that in the fact that a lot of high school students, you know, when they first start lifting or strength training of any kind, they always do like bench press first, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, my first lift I ever learned was a split jerk. Okay. So like right off the bat, I'm doing, especially for the time, you know, uh, maybe something we would think of more as athletic training. Yep. Training for athletes. So I was doing things like split jerks, hang power cleans hang power snatches right away. I didn't even bench press at all until I was like a junior in high school. Uh, so I, I think I was really, really lucky from that standpoint. Uh, but then of course, you know, you get our high school program evolved a little bit. We had more stuff at our high school because uh, previously I, would, I, I just trained at the local college on my own completely. Yep. And we had this guy come in and he would oversee our program. And I kind of was talking with him one day and like, Hey, do you just, do you uh, teach lifting for a job? He was like, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm an athletic trainer, but I I do some of this stuff. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's what, that's what I would like to do. And I kind of researched athletic training a little more, found out that's not what it was. It wasn't training athletes. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to, I don't want to be an athletic trainer from that perspective, I want to train athletes in the weight room and I would teach them how to, how to lift, how to make them faster, make them quicker, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was a little disappointed at that point in time, you know, I'm like a senior in high school, kind of found out that maybe this wasn't athletic training as a profession was, it wasn't what I thought it was. Yep. Uh, but luckily, uh, Central College, the, the local college had just hired a strength and conditioning coach full time. And I kind of got in contact with him and it was just like, yep, that's it. That's what I'm doing. Uh, he said, you know, when I met with him, if you come to central, you can work with me in the weight room. And that's all I needed to hear. You know, I went on all like visits and stuff, but I, I, I knew what I was going to do. Yep. Uh, so right out of high school, I went to central college, uh, majored in exercise science there. 
had a really, really good experience. So basically from my first year, I was thrust into the weight room in a student coaching role. And so I, I spent a good solid, you know, three and a half to four years being a student coach under that program. Uh, and then by the time I had graduated, they had developed a strength and conditioning major. So when I graduated, that was my degree. So uh, strength conditioning from Central College in Pella, uh, Iowa. Um, and then through that time, I really developed my, my interest in nutrition. So for my graduate uh, education, that's where I decided to go. Yep. Uh, I went to uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and uh, my degree there was nutrition and, and health with an emphasis in exercise. So I basically got my, my degree in nutrition science, but then ex-phys alongside that. Yep. Uh, and that was, that was really good for me. You know, I got a little bit of nutrition in college, but I'm sure anyone in exercise science knows you get you like one nutrition class. Yeah. Uh, and mine was taught by like a sport coach. So not someone who was really appropriate at the time. Uh, but at Nebraska, I also got my good nutrition education, but at the time I also worked with the dietitians there. Okay. So that's what really attracted me to, to Nebraska was they had two full-time dietitians. And when I emailed them and asked them if they had internships, they said, yes. And if you come here, you can work with us. So that's all I needed to hear, yeah. Again, right? If, if, if I can work under the people who are doing the job I want to do, I'm going to take that. Um, so I did that for my first year, worked under uh, a guy by the name of Josh Hinks, who was like the head uh, sports nutritionist there. I worked a little bit with basketball, like specifically, uh, but nothing too, too in-depth. But overall, I was just kind of helping out uh, whatever, whatever they needed. Uh, and then in my second year there, I became a teaching assistant with the nutrition department. Okay. So that is where I initially kind of thought, hmm, may maybe I want to teach. Because I wasn't a dietitian at the time. And it would have been uh, a little bit difficult to go down that route and not having, not doing dietetics in, in my undergrad, becoming a dietitian would have been, would have been a process. Yep. Um, so I, I, student, or I was a, a TA for the nutrition department. It was where I kind of initially got my teaching experience. And I really liked it. I liked lecturing to students. I liked when they came up to me after class and asked questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I just loved doing that. And I kind of liked that academic setting. Um, so when grad school was over, I decided to, to pursue a PhD. And uh, I actually had, I went to Iowa State uh, and started my PhD there in nutrition science. Um, now, I, that didn't end up working out. So like my project, originally I wanted to go and there's a guy doing more nutrition exercise research. And anyone who's been in that, at, that high of academics know that sometimes things fall through. Yep. Funding isn't there when it maybe it needs to be. Uh, so I couldn't work for him just because he didn't have money to fund me. He couldn't pay my stipend, all that stuff. So I ended up working for a guy who was looking at basically um, methyl group metabolism and health. So like one car. So he, his, uh, from a vitamin perspective, he looked at a lot of folate. All right, if, if listeners know uh, are familiar with like folate, um, it's a B vitamin, and. I kind of got this project of uh, looking at the effect of egg consumption on type two diabetes, okay. which is kind of, which is in my opinion, was really, really cool. So, um, and then I also worked for a guy who did vitamin D research. So egg, egg yolks have vitamin D in them. They have choline, which both play into both like folate metabolism uh, and in vitamin D. And so I got this, I kind of inherited this project and I kind of thought to myself, okay, this is all right. This will work out. Yep. This is an interesting project. I even got into some epigenetic type components because uh, the guy I was working for was, I mean, he was basically a biochemist. Um, so I kind of thought, all right, vitamin D, good, hot topic. Epigenetics, good. That's a hot topic as well. Um, so I got into it and... So right now, this whole, whole part, part of my journey, all people, 
right? I'm coaching somebody. I'm talking to somebody about their nutrition I'm in the weight room, all that stuff. I go from that and I'm with rats like the whole time. I went from people every day to rats every day. And that really just took its toll on me. Uh, I, I just didn't like going through my entire day and not really not seeing anybody. I was either in a lab, you know, in my, in my lab coat and goggles and pipetting things yep. or I was down in, you know, our other areas where we had kept all of our lab, lab animals, taking care of them. Uh, and just kind of was pretty clear to me that that's not what I, I meant was meant to be doing. Yep. Uh, so I actually ended up getting out of that before I got in too deep, which was, was a tough decision. Like it was a very tough decision. Um, because you think about it, it's, it's a good schedule. you you have a lot of freedom. Uh, I was still researching something that was cool, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a huge interest for me. Yeah. And I knew I needed to get back to, to people. So, uh, I ended up leaving that. And then I worked as a personal trainer in, in Des Moines for about six months. Okay. Uh, and through that time, you know, really by the luck of, um, you know, God's intervention, or, and, and if you want to call it luck, my brother texted me one day and told me that Northwestern had an opening for exercise science and strength coach. And I just thought that sounds perfect. That's yep. exactly what that sounds like something I want to do. So it was a teaching role mixed with strength and conditioning. So I could basically blend these two worlds that I've existed in through my education and do both of them. And I, I applied and ended up getting the position, and that's where I've been at for the past, uh, going in my third year now. Third year, okay. Yeah, yep. Good. So, uh, you know, on that nutritional, you know, aspect, a question I'm sure you get a lot. Same here is through all the the jargon of supplements. What are some supplements that you actually recommend for athletes to take? What are some of the mm -hmm. top ones that they have efficacy? They've, they've been proven. You know, what, what are some of the things that you tell your athletes that if you take, you know, what are some things you recommend? Yeah, so I uh, I usually give a team talk, like every like the fall of every year. I always I give a team talk to either all all my teams and then the other teams that that want them. And at the end, I always have that my little supplement section. Yep. And uh, you know, I always preface that with okay, context of a of a good diet. Yes. Yeah. And if you're not training hard, don't even worry about supplements, kind of thing. But there are some that I recommend. Um, so I'll start with, with creatine. Um, that's, that's kind of my, my initial go-to with, with regards to recommendation. And I don't know if you want me to go into like exactly what I recommend, uh, from dosing protocol, but yeah, creatine, uh, a just a general multivitamin, um, fish oil. I'll, I'll still recommend fish oil, uh, and then caffeine. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's when I always went back and forth on a little bit. Like, do I want to talk about this or not? Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, I thought, let's just talk about it because if they're going to use it and they are, let's make sure they know how, Yep. or, or let's make sure let's maybe even debunk a little bit of the, Oh my gosh, caffeine equals bad. Yeah. You know, mysticism that surrounds it. Um, so I, I do talk about, how to use caffeine, caffeine dosing, um, and then like how they can get it. Yeah. Um, and, and that I think is, has been a good decision. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's really usually what I stick to is those four. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you get a, a lot of questions uh, in terms of the creatine and in terms of athletes or you're, you know, in the college and somebody less of parents, but of the old kind of wives tales and myths about creatine, it's going to screw up your liver, your kidneys, there's going to <laughs> muscle cramps and pulls. Do you get a lot of those questions? Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, not from the students. Okay. Um, I've gotten a couple parent questions just through email. Like, Hey, uh, my student is a senior in high school. He's looking at Northwestern. What can he be doing? What supplements can he take? Nutrition, that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, the question I get the most, honestly, is pre-workout. Yeah. That's okay. what I get the most. And so I do actually talk about that as well. I don't talk about like a specific like pre-workout necessarily, but I just address it right yeah. away. Because typically if I don't, like they, that's the question I get is like, what, hey, what, what pre-workout should I take? Yeah. Um, 
and so that that's the question I get the most is what should they be taking? And they want to, they, when they ask that they're thinking supplement. Yes. Yeah. Right. What supplement should I take pre-workout? Yeah. Um, so that's what I usually get the most. And how, how do you address that question? Well, uh, by that time in the talk, I've, oh, I've gone through general and basic nutrition. Yep. And we've also talked a little bit about nutrient timing. And so I'll always say your best pre-workout is food. Yep. Like your, your best pre-workout is making sure that you you have enough calories. You've been eating consistently throughout the day, whatever that means for you and your schedule. Um, that's initially like step one, because if you don't have those set in place, that pre-workout is essentially worthless, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. you may feel something, which is, is going to be due to whatever caffeine is in that product, yep. but very few pre-workout formulated products have, uh, first of all, ingredients that, are, that work, yep. that actually per enhance your performance in the session, and if they do have maybe ingredients that we think are efficacious, they're not dosed properly anyway. Yeah. It just, I, you know, you see it, oh, you see it so much yeah, it's, it's, where you, you have this huge laundry list of ingredients and there's like a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. Oh, by the way, 300 milligrams of caffeine. Yeah. That, and then they think, okay, this product is awesome because it makes them feel great. Well, just buy some caffeine tablets. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I tell them, um, you know, if you're, I tell them, make sure that you're, you got your nutrition in line, make sure that you're eating consistently and you're eating enough. And then we, we talk about right, what, what are the right foods, yep. here's a food list and all that kind of thing. Um, and then we can start to talk about pre-workouts, but most of the time you see that they don't have ingredients that are worth, worth your time and worth your money. And if they do maybe have something we think might work, it's not dosed right anyway. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, the same thing I would tell them is that your best pre-workout is going to be what did you eat the, the previous day or so far in the day leading up to the workout? How did you sleep last night? If sleep. you constantly need a pre-workout, you're not addressing the other needs, your nutrition, right. your hydration, your sleep, your rest, recovery. If you constantly need that, then exactly. you're missing the bigger picture yep. with those other things, which for young kids, sometimes it's hard. To, they always think there's that magic pill. Um, <laughs> right. But hey, you have a lunch and a snack and or you know, sleep eight, ten hours and you'll feel exactly. Like, oh. Yeah, sleep's the other one that that's huge. Oh, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah. Like there's no there's no more powerful tool for just general recovery and and your ability to focus, train yeah. hard, um and and feel good and ready than sleep. And it's free. <laughs> and it's free. It's not sexy, and, but it's, it works and it's free and you don't need to go to GNC and pick nope. a miracle tab. Mm -hmm. up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I, if people, if athletes would understand that, <laughs> yeah. it would make our jobs a lot easier. Yep, absolutely. Oh, perfect. So one thing, you, you teach a couple classes. Um, yeah. You can go to those classes, but one thing I you know, follow you on social media and I recommend all the listeners follow Corey on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. He does an awesome job of sharing information. But one thing that you do in your classes, you bring in a couple like guest speakers via kind of like this, like Skype online. Yeah. yeah. Your class, you had Dr. Dr. Q, you had uh, um, uh, Mike. Um, John Mike. John Mike yeah. uh, yeah. on to talk to your class. And I think that's incredible. You know, going like both of us going through some of that exercise science undergrad. I think when I was in school, that would be awesome <laughs> to hear from a different voice or someone in our field, you know, the expert, I guess you could say in our field. Right just a different learning style or just a learning aspect for the kids. I think it's awesome what you're doing. Talk about how you're doing those things. Yeah. Um, that's exactly why I decided to do that and bring that in because that's something I wish I would have had. And the, but the reality is we didn't really have that Yeah. when we were going through school. No. And it's not like we're all that old, but still um, we now have the technology and social media and Skype and video calls that we can connect. And so the specific class that, I, that I've done this in is personal training. So I teach personal training um, here. And while I have been a personal trainer, it was only for six months. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't long enough to really um, 
figure a lot out from that perspective. And while yes, me and you, we both train people. I think maybe, you know, we would both agree that athletic performance training is, is different than personal training from the perspective that in personal training, you may have quite a bit of your clients that don't care about strength, speed, power. Yep. They, they want to feel better, yep. enhance their life. Like John, John Mike, who just talked uh, to my class, made a great point that they're coming to you to enhance their overall happiness. Yep. Like that's what they want from you. Yes, I mean, all these other things that are good, lose body fat, um, be in better shape. But like ultimately, they want their life to be enhanced by things that you do with them. Yep. So my thought process was you have all these different factors of, of personal training, kind of like uh, strength and conditioning, where I'm not, I, w- I don't know if I would say that I am the best person to uh, speak to them. So uh, Dr. Uh, Quinn Hennick just uh, was our first presenter and he did movement screening. Um, I don't have a ton of experience in that area. So I don't want to have this lecture and yep. try to like make, not make something up, but just have something where I can't give them the best product. Yeah. So um, that was one of the, the big reasons I, I decided, hey, let's try to do this approach of let's bring in people who are experts in this specific area yep. and have them talk to my students. Uh, so this idea initially came up when uh, I, see, I would see Brad Schoenfeld mm-hmm. post, hey, so-and-so just spoke to my exercise science internship class. So you know that people are willing to do it and that it's relatively easy. So I just decided, hey, let's reach out, reach out to a bunch of people and see if uh, they'd be willing to do it. And so far, I think everybody but one person was able to do it in yeah. seven years. Yeah. So we've got a great lineup. And so they get a different perspective from someone who is very, you know, more, very experienced, uh, and has a lot of knowledge on a specific topic. And then they also get to uh, develop a connection. Yeah. Right. So uh, one of the requirements for these, the speakers that come in, my students, I, I tell them, hey, you have to go research this person, come to class with a couple questions already locked and loaded. Uh, and then they, are, they have to go out and follow them on social media outlets. Yep. And I tell them, okay, now this is what you do. You tweet at that person or you send them a Facebook message or something like that. And you, you know, thank them, but then tell them specifically something you got out of it. And you just never know like what can happen with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that's how I've developed so many connections over the past couple of years is just this person put out something. I liked it. I connected with them on social media. So, Hey, uh, so-and-so I liked what you did. I like this from your presentation or, or podcast, you know, keep up the good work. Yeah. Then they all do that. And I, so that just gives them something different than what you typically get in your, your normal class structure. So they get the knowledge base from, from what that person has to say. And they also get the connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like the, the one I saw with Dr. Q is like, um, it was like a hands-on practice. Yeah, absolutely. A pretty thorough squat assessment. And Oh yeah. That's something that I mean, when I was in school, we never went through anything like that. And now you're learning about, all right, so you got some of the book stuff, but how do we apply that to a real human being? Or- exactly. And you know, yeah, we, that's exactly it. Here's our textbook. Here's what, you know, the NSCA or the ACSM says about assessment. Well, you know, that only can take you so far. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's get in, let's bring in someone who does this for his job on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. What can he tell us about assessing somebody coming into you and how to effectively use that assessment to train that person? And then you can get into actual uh, personalized programming that everybody wants. Yep. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just think that's a really cool tool that you're doing. And, um, for exercise science programs out there, I think that is an awesome potential outlet for the you know classes to do that. So give us, walk us through what a typical day kind of looks like for you. 
So, uh, yeah. So every day for me starts out coaching. Yep. So I'm kind of, uh, there's, so there's two full-time guys here. I'm, I'm the assistant and then our head coach, uh, Kyle Oxner, uh, is actually going into his fifth year here. So in total, we've had, you know, five years of strength and conditioning, but I'm kind of the early morning guy. I have football. Yep. So, uh, we have to, uh, if we don't train in the morning that I don't know, it's just tough to, to insert a team that big any yeah. other time of the day. Yep. I'm kind of been the morning guy. Uh, so every day will start. If you're, if we're in season, it's 6 a.m. If it's off season, it's 5:45. Okay. Um, so you know, I'll show up to the facility sometime between like 5 and 5:15. Uh, just kind of like get my mind ready, go through some stuff. We'll train. We we train, and we got we have to be done by seven or very soon after seven. Okay. Just because classes here start at 7:45. Yep. So we got to give them time to you know, go to the cafeteria, eat, shower, get cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll train from either six to seven or five forty-five to seven. Um, sometimes I may have another group after that. It just depends on my teaching schedule. Yeah. So, uh, I may have my own seven forty-five class. Yep. So in, in that, that case, then we'll, that will be done, uh, training for the morning. And then from anywhere from eight until one o'clock, that's when I'll teach. Okay. So typically I have two classes a day. Uh, that one will be either at like uh, 8 o'clock or 7.45. They may have like a mid-morning one. And then a couple classes I teach are at, at noon. Okay. That's when I'll do my teaching. So I may have a little bit of time right after groups or like office time. Or if I want to train myself, that's yep. when I train. Yep. Uh, or I'll go right into class. So I'll, I'll teach my two classes for the day sometime between 10 or s between eight o'clock and noon. Uh, and then uh, afternoon groups sometimes will start up at 2.15. Kind of depends. Uh, in the years past, I've split up football into two groups. Yep. And so this year just worked out with our one group, uh, the upperclassmen, I'm, I'm not, not the whole team. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so sometimes they start as early as 2.15, but uh, – in the afternoon, if it's 3.30, anytime between 3.30, 3.30 and 6.30, that weight room is packed. Like okay. it's, it's there's training going on can, like constantly every day from six to seven and then 3.30 to 6.30, okay. that room is being used. Okay. So I may have a couple teams or a team during that time, but uh, from a training perspective, I mean, it kind of varies. I could be done by 4.30, Yep. I could be done by 6.30. It just yep. kind of depends on the day. Yep. So this is kind of a general question, but what does a typical training session look like? We know that would probably look different for different teams, but mm -hmm. uh, what does your typical kind of training session look like structure-wise? How does it flow? Um, so, I mean, it's pretty standard, man. Uh, we'll, we'll start off with, you know, in our, in our warm-up. Like, do you want me to go through, like, different, like, yeah. points of the warm-up and stuff yeah. like that? Um. So we'll go through, I'll just start them off with like some kind of drill or exercise or, or something like that just to get their core temp up, yep. get, get them, their body moving, get their sweat going. So that could be, that's where I like to implement like a lot of like ladder drills, okay. uh, dot drills if the team is small enough. Um, we'll do just more di general dynamic jogging type movements, just something to get that initial like raise in te core temp, get sweat going, yep. uh, decrease neural tone and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they, if they do any, uh, foam rolling, we'll, we'll, they'll do that beforehand. Okay. We'll, we don't really take session time, uh, unless it's like a recovery type session. Yep. Uh, so typically we'll start with that. And then after that, we'll go into more of what you might consider your dynamic warmups. Um, so like walking type movements, but it, for me, it really depends on what we're doing for that day. Okay. Like if we're going to, if we're going to go into some speed training or running, yeah, it's going to be more of your walking, jogging type dynamic movements where they're going to stretch and walk at the same time. Like your okay. typical, like knee grab lunge and twist type things. Uh, but if we're just lifting, then I'll take a little bit of a different approach where the, we'll start on the ground like on our back and then we'll kind of work from the ground up. Okay. Like more of a developmental position type yep. progression. If we're just lifting, if we're just, if I just know we're going to go in the weight room 
uh, like, I'll, like wrestling. Um, like my wrestling team, we'll see more of that kind of warm up than maybe your uh, speed prep looking type warm up. Yep. Because they don't run. <laughs> we just go, we lift, uh, especially when they're in the off season. Uh, so that's kind of, they'll take like the next five to 10 minutes for that. Okay. Uh, and then we may end with something a little bit more like intense just to kind of like bring them, okay, back and get them ready. Or we just might head in to the weight room. And then as far as like the, the session itself for, from a lifting perspective, again, it's going to be pretty typical. So start with, um, your power exercise or your power component of the workout session, whether that is, uh, if, if, you, if we have a team who's doing Olympic lifts, that's when they'll do it. If we have a team that's gonna do any kind of post-activation potentiation type training, that's when they'll do it. Any kind of jumping, so hex jumps, barbell jump squats, yep. we'll start with that, just like typical, you know, I think most, most coaches would. Yep. Uh, that's also a time where I like to insert maybe more of your corrective type exercises. Yep. So they'll do their main power exercise and then I'll usually pair that with two corrective and or what I would consider movement prep exercises. Yep. Uh, and that's gonna be geared toward the movement of the day. Whatever their next next phase of the, of the workout is, which yep. will primarily be your main strength portion, those exercises will be geared toward that. So let's say, say for example, you got a, a squat variation. Mm -hmm. what, may, what are some of the, your favorite correctives for, or movement prep for say a, a big yep. squat day? That's a good question. Uh, so it'll typically be some type of core exercise where they've got to move their lower body while around a stable pelvis. Okay. So if you're like a new athlete, if you're a freshman, that's going to be probably some kind of dead bug variation. Yep. Uh, this could also, I could also throw like more like glute activation intensive exercises here too. Uh, so I'll use like dead bug variations. I'll use bird dog variations. So that'd be a little bit more intense. And then uh, I like to add intensity there. Yeah. So you know, I think I know people might think, oh, bird dog, that's pretty simple. Well, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but in my opinion, if you do go bird dog correctly, it's actually really hard. Yeah, it is, definitely. <laughs> it's very hard. So we actually, uh, there's a lot of variations I can do with that. So we'll just do something like that, where they've got to move their limbs, specifically lower body, while keeping their pelvis locked in place and there's not not a whole lot of play there yeah so i don't want to see a bird dog where their pelvis is going through anterior posterior tilt like crazy yep. where they're or they're um rocking to one side and their hips are swinging open yeah just something like that um so that'll be like the, maybe the core exercise and then if it's a squat it'll be maybe a hip mobility okay. exercise or ankle exercise uh, just things where you maybe see limitations in the squat uh, I tend to have focused a little bit more on the ankle recently just because that's where I've seen more issues yeah. like real issues yep. not just my hips feel tight because um, the hip stuff I'll, I'll address in the warm-up like yep. yeah we'll, we'll, we'll look in the warm-up to loosen their hips up but if they have an ankle restriction uh, I'll, I'll put that in the workout so I know that I have coaches who have eyes on it and then we're a little bit more, we can watch that a little bit more. So it'll be like something like that, a core exercise, moving the limbs around a stable pelvis, and then probably either hip mobility or ankle mobility. Okay, excellent. That's good stuff. Uh, and then maybe for bench, we're looking at lat, lat flexibility or decreased tone in the lat, and we're looking at serratus anterior activation. Yep. Just something like that. Uh, for a movement prep standpoint. That's good stuff. Uh, and then after that, it's like, okay, here's your, what, what's your main strength component of the day? You know, you're gonna have your bigger lift, squat bench, military press, whatever. Uh, and I always pair exercises. That, that's one thing that's always in constant in my programming. Yeah. Like from, from early on, pair exercises together. Uh, so that basically for me every day is total body. Okay. Uh, most of our teams train three days a week, yep. maximum. We may have a couple that are four, but if it's a three day a week, every session is total body Yeah. from the standpoint that you have upper and lower components every day. Yes. Yep. Um, typically, and then for, for three, three day a week program, uh, for me, they're pretty much doing every movement pattern. 
Okay. They're going to uh, do a quad dominant low body, hip dominant lower body, horizontal and or vertical pressing, yep. and then some kind of row. Yeah. So vertical or horizontal pulling every day. Okay. Um, and then, then if, you know, we'll sort of power strength and then like whatever is like your secondary strength for the day, maybe yeah. a lot less emphasis, but since it's total body, honestly, man, that's, it could be just as intense as that kind of middle block. Yeah. Um, and that's usually where we'll be done okay. from a lifting perspective. I don't, I don't go much beyond that. We kind of think three sections yep. for the training session. That's usually going to get us to about an hour. Yep. Um, and then I'll, I'll have some, some post work for them, extra foam rolling, maybe some breathing exercises, uh, stuff geared towards trying to get them feeling good before they leave. Yeah. Uh, Kind of one thing I've I've stole from from Quinn Hennick is I don't want them to leave feeling like they're still in the squat rack. Yeah, okay. you know, <laughs> or I don't want them to. If we uh, had a big upper body pressing day, I don't want them to feel like they're Frankenstein, you know, still in the bench press rack holding a bench, yep. holding a bar above their chest. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to undo that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, you focus on the hips. Uh, we focus on the spinal erectors. Just trying to decrease any kind of tone we've created through the workout. Okay. And so when they leave, they feel like normal human beings that are not feeling all tight and toned up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What, are, what are some of the things that you, uh, modalities that you're using for that to reduce muscle tone, deregulate the nervous system, get parasympathetic mm -hmm. response? What, what are some of your favorite things? You talked about breathing a little bit, right? Some yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's something we've incorporated a lot this year for the first time. Personally, I have anyway. Yep, yep. Um, where... Like you said, we're trying to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> like I really have, and we still do static stretching and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. But my main goal post workout is just to chill out a little bit. Let's yeah. let's come down from maybe the high of the workout, and that is really going to jumpstart that recovery process. Absolutely, yeah. So that's actually where I will prescribe a lot more foam rolling. Yep. So I'll I'll foam I'll foam roll the areas that we hit. So okay. if it's a heavy squat day, we're going to foam roll the, the spinal erectors, the quads and the glutes and hamstrings. So just focus on the areas that were, that were hit uh, predominantly. Uh, and then we may do like a 90, 90 breathing. Okay. So for listeners who aren't maybe familiar with that, uh, they'll be, they'll be on their back with their feet up on a wall. Okay. Knees, knees and hips will be bent at 90 degrees. Uh, and sometimes we'll have a foam roller between their knees, yep. but most of the time I just want that position because it's very, uh, it's easy. It's, it's relaxed, it's safe. And so they can, they can just start to think about just calming down. Uh, and then in that position, we'll just hit some like two sets of five, uh, diaphragmatic breathing. So I cue them, make sure, let's take a big deep breath in through your nose. Make sure that your belly is rising first. Yep. So actually have them put their hands on their stomach. And if their chest is rising and their hands aren't moving, yeah. just tell them, okay, okay, reset a little bit. Make sure hands are going up first. Yep. I realize that it doesn't always mean they're using their diaphragm, but they're certainly not using their diaphragm if they're breathing, breathing from the yeah. chest first. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell them, make sure the hands go up first, and then you'll try to feel that breath coming up through the chest and even up into where you're starting to feel it in the back of your head. And that's getting that just like a huge full rib cage diaphragm expansion and then exhale. And, and really from, for the egg for exhalation, I just tell them just make sure it's longer than normal. Yeah. Like don't, uh, don't like force the issue, but make sure it's a good solid exhale, like five, six seconds and make sure pretend almost like it's a sigh. Yeah. You know, feel like that tension releasing and going away and just that state of being calm and we'll hit, so we'll hit like two sets of five. Uh, and then I'll maybe pair that with something to make their low back feel good. Like a child's pose hold yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Extended cat pose hold. Yep. Um, that's kind of one of been one of my more favorite pairings is, you know, you, cause you can get a low back stretch with that 90, 90 yeah, breathing. Yeah. If you expand yeah. 360 degrees throughout your torso, you will stretch your low back. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen this too, with so many people have tight low backs, 
that's just kind of a pair set I've gone to. That's right. I like that. Yeah. Oh, and then, uh, and then after that, we'll do some static stretching sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know everyone has a feeling maybe on static stretching, whether it's useful or not useful, but at the end of the day, I've kind of taken the stance that it makes athletes feel good. They seem to enjoy it. So we're still accomplishing that chill out yep. mentality. Uh, I've just now maybe gone to what I put in there is maybe better than what I used to put in there. Okay, perfect. So yeah. instead of doing just a straight up hamstring stretch, we're going to do a hamstring stretch stretch with a leg lowering. Yep. yep. So it's like a, an FMS corrective active straight legs correction type of thing. Yeah. So you're still getting a hamstring stretch, but maybe at the end of the day, you're actually in a correct pelvic position at the same time. Yeah. Stuff like that. Awesome. Awesome. So if you look at your, what you're doing kind of this year compared to years past, is there anything that looks different in your training this year than say in the years past or anything that sticks out that you kind of change in your, you know, mentality or programming or how you're coaching anything like that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, a lot has changed <laughs> a lot. Oh man. Cause I'll, I'll be honest when I got this position, I had come, I got this position essentially being out of strength and conditioning for three years. Yeah. Cause, cause new, when I was at Nebraska, it was nutrition. Yep. I didn't, I didn't work in strength and conditioning. Yes. I was in the same area and I may have talked to those guys, uh, talk shop with them, but I wasn't in, I wasn't involved in the day to day stuff. And Iowa state definitely was not, yeah. the, not, not strength and conditioning related. So I kind of started this position and I had three years of catch up. And so early on, I, I just had to go with what I knew. So it looked very much like, you, you know, the programs I would have written in college. I think we all would agree that, you know, I mean, it's, it's not bad necessarily, but things change throughout the years. This field is so dynamic. Things oh, yeah. change so quickly. Uh, so needless to say, a lot has changed. Uh, I guess the thing that pops into my head that changed a lot for me is that kind of warm ups period. Okay. Like my warm ups have changed so much and my mobility work has changed so much or what I consider mobility work has changed so much that uh I don't I think a lot of if a lot of my colleagues old colleagues had come to one of our sessions and watched me warm up my teams or coach my teams throughout the warm up, they'd be, it'd be a little bit unrecognizable to them. Okay. Yeah. So different than, than maybe what I had been doing in the past, yeah. meaning like that developmental position type stuff that I didn't even know existed <laughs> when I got into this job. Yeah. Didn't know even, yeah, I was just totally new to me. But what I liked about it was you can ad address and attack exercise technique and proper technique in the warm up at the same time. Yeah. So it can it can serve as your yes, warm up meaning I'm actually going to warm you up, get you warm, sweating, all that stuff, but at the same time I can use things and teach you correct positions, refine technique. Like if I do things correctly, your technique may be better at the end of this warm up than than when we started. Absolutely, yeah. That's what I liked about it. Or just other just mobility uh, my mobility menu, I guess you could say has increased dramatically. Yep. Like when I started this job, if you asked me for a T spine, sagittal plane mobility exercise, I don't know if I would have been able to tell you one. Yeah. And now I've got a good list of them. Same with ankle. Yep. Um, same with like hip mobility. Uh, one thing I've added into our programs with hip mobility is transverse plane hip mobility. Okay. Like that's not something I ever even considered two years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, everyone wants to stretch their hips in the in the in the uh, sagittal plane because they think tight hip flexors, tight hip flexors, or my hamstrings are tight. Uh, and when I learned, when I kind of learned some new some things on hip mobility about internal external rotation, where everyone wants to favor external rotation, what about internal rotation? Yeah. And that 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 just more global hip mobility has been a huge change in my program. Excellent. Um, so, I mean, other things I've, that have changed for me a lot, 
like adding in the mobility during during sessions, like in session. Yep. Never, I never used to do that. Um, not having Olympic lifts <laughs> in my programming. That was a big change when I got here. I had to learn how to program without using the Olympic lifts. Okay. Yep. Because we just did not have the facilities to do it. We 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 couldn't do it. It was uh, our barbells weren't adequate. Our weights weren't adequate. Our um, group size to weight room equipment ratio is not adequate yeah, yep. um coach to athlete ratio couldn't so that was a huge difference for me so learning some uh, you know post activation potentiation techniques that i really had never used before um broadening my my menu with med ball throws jumps all that kind of stuff was was different uh, and then I think the other big thing that's changed a lot for me is a little bit more of athlete autonomy Yes. with regards to, to warm up and training. Whereas in the warm up, there's a lot more, I'll, I'll let them do things at their own pace a little bit more where it's not always, everything's on a cadence, like up, down, one up down you know what i mean yes yeah i mean sometimes there's obviously situations that call for that if especially in a very large group um so i may give them a little more freedom from that perspective to go at their own pace and what i liked about that was it allows them to not be afraid to make a mistake yeah because i don't want them to be so worried about what i'm doing in the warm-up and like staying on point with everybody else that they can't think about what they're doing and then learn from it. So that's something that, that I've changed maybe in the warm up, but then also in training too, there's a little more autonomy in training than, than I have in years past. And I'll give a good example of that. Um, right now football is in, is in season, right? So they have a lot of option yep. with what they do. <clears throat> Uh, from a lifting perspective, we'll we'll do one day that's more mobility oriented and that's more like stay in shape oriented, yep. more aerobic oriented. But then our lifting day, they actually have a huge amount of of uh, choice in what they decide they want to do. So I'll I'll have like an overall structure. Okay, so I know that I maybe want to do a lower body quad dominant exercise and an upper body horizontal press dominant exercise. But I'll give them a little menu. All right, so here's bench press, single arm dumbbell press, or a half kneeling single arm mind press. Yep. All right, and they can choose what they want based on how they're feeling, how much did they play. Obviously that bench press is gonna take a little bit more toll overall than the half kneeling mind press. Yeah. Okay, both though are a little bit more horizontal in nature, so you're still working the same muscle groups in relatively the same pattern, but the guy, maybe the O lineman who had a D lineman banging on him all day and was in every single play offensively, he will probably, if I asked him to go come in and bench 315 for four sets of three, you know, he'll probably want to punch me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Versus, okay, let's come in and let's at least do some mind pressing. And then we may, may actually clean up some, some shoulder issues if he's having any. Yeah, yeah. You know, if he's having some, uh, some uh, any kind of movement problems there, we can maybe address that. And then you're getting some other good stuff with the mind press. But I've done that a lot more this, I've never, did, actually this is the first year I've ever done anything like that. And it's worked out really well, uh, especially when you're training a big group. Um, but then I've also, over the past year, have tried to insert as much uh, auto-regulatory stuff as I can. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So. We're, we're lucky enough to have five tendo units. Okay. So with groups that can, that can handle it, meaning size wise, yep. I will do, I'll try to use up, use the tendos as much as I can. Okay. So what that looked like, um, I've used them a couple ways with that. So coming off of, uh, our season last winter. So like, uh, maybe in January for football, we had a pretty small group of upperclassmen okay. and they were in multiple groups. So really in each group, we had about 25 upperclassmen total. 
So I was, and I was, I'm looking at that. I'm like, okay, maybe we can actually use these tendos here. That that's a decent ratio. I can make it work. Yep. And how I used that was, I used that to gauge their intensity. So they they would get, uh, let's say we had back squat for the day, and they would have a range of velocities they had to stay within yep. with their weight. Uh, and what that allowed us to do is not have to like guess on their load. Yeah. So if I wanted that load to be at 85 or 90%, I would prescribe the velocity that corresponds to that. Yep. And I, that way I know that barbell weight is 85 to 90%. Yeah. Or I'm very, very sure that it is. Yep. But coming off the season like that, everyone's going to be a little different spot. Yeah. So even though I may have a projected one RM for a certain athlete that was based off of like fall testing or whatever, yep that's probably not their one RM anymore. Yeah. It may be pretty different. So if I put that on their card, they may not be ready for that. And then we're kind of guessing, okay, yeah. let's uh, try this and let's see how that feels. Well, with the Tendo, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty sure that at a whatever velocity, they're going to be at 85 or 90% or whatever the prescription yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and then I used it later in the spring for just general like speed work make sure you're in this range for your speed squats or your speed bench with chains or with bands. Yep. Uh, and then this summer, again, we had a smaller group. So I was able to use those tendos for our, our Olympic lifts. Okay. So making sure that that bar speed is moving fast enough to actually increase power. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how I've used the tendo units from that perspective. And then the nice thing about that is weight can change day to day velocity might stay the same yeah right so one guy might come in feeling really really great and on back squat he if he has to hit a certain velocity like 0.3 or whatever last week he had 350 on the on the bar this week he's feeling awesome for whatever reason maybe he finally got his eight hours of sleep like we've been telling him to do right and he he does uh three 380 yeah i don't know you know just that that's that allows them that freedom you feeling good today? Sweet. Let's hit it. You're not feeling good today. That's okay. It doesn't, that's fine. Just hit that velocity. So we know that you're training the quality we want to train. Yeah. And they don't have to feel bad about, Oh, I only hit, I, you know, I only hit 330 today instead of 350. Yeah. I don't care about the weight. I care about, are you moving the barbell as, as yeah. the fast, the speed that I want? Um, and then we also played around with, uh, the APRE. Yep. Uh, this past, uh, so auto-regulatory progressive resistance exercise uh, method this past uh, off-season, I, I did that with my football teams and my wrestling team. And uh, man, I, I don't know if we've done anything that, that has gotten my athletes stronger faster. Really? Wow. Yeah. Like in, in, a, in a span of, of eight weeks of training and really only using the APRE for four of those eight weeks. Okay. You know, we're talking guys putting on 25, 50, 75 pounds on their squat wow. type of thing. And I realized that there are some of them were coming in in a little bit of a deficit. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of getting back to where they were and then stronger. But still, like in eight weeks, yeah, that's I'll take fun. that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take that. So that, that was another one that we used, that, that I used, um, that I liked a lot. And I'm going to continue to mess around with that. Yeah. Uh, at the University of Buick here, we, got, we have 10 tendos. Oh, nice. Our head coach here does a really good job with that. And, but like you said, it, they, it takes the guesswork out of what you're doing a lot. You know, percentages right. can fluctuate day to day, like you said, depending on the athlete's fatigue, their load, their stress, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that velocity, you, mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't cheat that. Nope. Yeah. He, he's got – the last two years we've been collecting – he's been collecting a lot of data. Um, and like with man, you know, his book and what he kind of showed was he changed the way he did Olympic lifts because – the velocity is way too low. Right, exactly. So you got to take the load off. And so you kind of, like you said, take the guesswork out of the, the game and you, uh, you make it specific to the needs of the athlete. And right. another thing when I was up in Minnesota, they do is I've been playing around with is I like the idea of like certain percentage drop-offs. Like you're going to just, oh, another yeah. way to all regulate, the sets is undetermined. Here's our reps. You're going to keep going sets-wise until you have a percentage drop-off. Absolutely. And that's what Deke was really – Interesting some stuff in that, and then um, you can do the certain percentage drop off 
if you want to do like a two or three percent drop off, you can train more frequently. If you want to do higher percent drop off, it's going to be, you know, cause a little bit of a, more of a stress. Right. Um, but some interesting stuff that the Tendo allows. Oh yeah. It's awesome. Awesome. It's tool. usually interesting. And like with that method, it's kind of the same, same deal with that drop off. If you're, if you're feeling like Superman that day, yeah, let's hit more sets. Let's hit it. Let's go. Yeah. But if you're not, that's going to naturally correct for itself. And you're allowing the athlete to progress at the rate that they need to. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you're, they're either progressing a lot faster, which is good. Or if they need the brakes put on, the brakes are naturally going to get put on. Yeah. And that's what I love about auto regulatory training. It's all, yeah, it is. It's, it's powerful. Like we had a, we're doing some flying tens. Oh yeah. We're going to do it off a percentage breakdown or mm. percentage drop off. And one athlete ended up with, I think like 21 <laughs> and one athlete had three, you know, just the way that it works out. Um, but like I said, it gives each, instead of guessing for the whole group, each individual gets their, their required needs, which is beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. That's good stuff. Um, you talk about facility. Now, your old facility may not have been up to standard, but holy <laughs> crap, your new one is <laughs> real. You guys work yeah. with Stormex, right? I mean, they do great stuff. But talk about your facility, man. That thing is a world class. That thing's awesome. Yeah, it is awesome, man. And we're so lucky. Like, we've gotten so much support from our administration. It's just crazy. And, and I'd be, you know, Coach Oxnard had, did an amazing job. Like when I showed up, a lot of the a lot of the legwork had already been done. Okay. I kind of <laughs> I came in when the fun start, stuff started. <laughs> yeah. Like I came in when uh, okay, let's start dreaming about equipment. Yeah. Right. And Kyle, Kyle had done most of the the, the hard stuff, and uh, but our, our athletic administration, our the college itself, um, our alumni have been amazing. And that's the only reason that, that this was even a possibility. But yeah, our, our old one, while it was much better than most people, like it still was not the worst situation in the world. It had, it had its limitations. Yep. Um, but yeah, right now we're, we're extremely lucky. So uh, we've got, you know, t 20 total racks, 10, 10 full cages, 10 half racks. Uh, but then one thing that, that Kyle really did a good job, good job of is the outside of our cage is also a half rack. Yeah. We really have 30 total. Like you're thinking like squat rack stations, there's 30. Um, and then Sorenex was really good with working with us. Uh, they gave us like special attachments for like accelerated band work. Yep. Yep. Uh, where, where we have extensions coming off the cage where we can, we can loop bands around. Um, we've got eight TRX stations. Every, every single rack has its own landmine. So we have 20 landmines. Yep. Uh, we've got 10 Alico barbells. Um, we've got uh, now a new thing that just happened was all of our 45s in our facility are Alico bumper plates. Okay. We got just, I mean, it's maybe it's more, I don't really need to explain all of it, but just logistically the way the weight room guy was set up, uh, this is a change that uh, both Kyle and I thought needed to be made and our alumni just made it happen. Yeah, it was awesome. amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. So really lucky there. Uh, but I think one of the things that we have, that we decided to do that was a great decision was we put a 25 yard strip of turf in the weight room. Yeah. That was a great uh, decision on Kyle's part because we use it all the time. That's our open space. Uh, for med ball throws, uh, plyos, um, we can still do quite a bit of lateral yep. agility work on that with with a relatively small team. Or if we if we put it in the workout as part of like a PAP complex, we can do that. Uh, great, great uh, addition on his part. Um, you know, the addition of kettlebells is has been great. I love using kettlebells. That was one thing that I really got out of my time as a personal trainer was just how to, how to properly use a lot, do a lot of kettlebell movements. So that's something I've been able to inc incorporate. Uh, and then the other game changer for us has been an indoor, indoor practice or indoor turf. Yeah, that's amazing. What's the, what, what size is that? So total size of the actual turf is, is 50 yards by 50 yards. Wow. Uh, that, the, that's not usable turf. So like the lines that you would see on it is actually 40 yards. Okay. 
and it's not quite like I mean it's a 50 yards across so it's not quite a full football football field across but that just allowed us to when we're doing off-season agility and speed training you can lace up the cleats okay and do you're doing more uh sport-like agility exercises and you're not having to do it you know in a gym or something like that where you know footwear becomes an issue what's the quality of the gym floor kind of thing uh and that's just been it's been amazing that's awesome. absolutely amazing yeah everyone's got to go see and take a picture look at the pictures and videos that you guys have on that oh absolutely yeah if you go on our on our northwestern uh, athletics website you, you there's a 360 tour i'd highly recommend it like so, like i said sornex has done a great job with us and uh it's it's pretty incredible i'm lucky <laughs> yeah it, it's beautiful it's beautiful uh, so I know you're, you know, an avid continued education, you know, you end up going to clinics, presentations, reading, all that kind of stuff. What are some of your, what are three of your, your, you know, top books that you say have changed the way you look at coaching or view your job or yeah, just yeah. really great books that you've read? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, the most recent one that I've read that has impacted me a lot is Extreme Ownership by uh, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Uh, and the whole premise there is, I mean, it says it right in the title, right? Is everything that happens, you know, in your job or whatever it may be life, the mindset you need to have is that is on you. Yeah. Like you have to own that. Like don't blame other people. Uh, if something went great, yeah, own that, but, but also like praise others. But if something went wrong, okay, my fault. That, yeah. That's on me. What, what could I have done? What can I do to make sure that doesn't happen again? Uh, it's actually, it's like one of the few books I've read twice. Yeah. Very close together. Like it like separated by maybe a month. Yeah. Just because uh, it's so, well, I mean, that's naturally interesting to me because I, I love, uh, you know, military stories and thing like, things like that. And it's very in the context of that but they do a great job of here's this military story of the time when we were in Iraq or whatever. And here's exactly how we applied that when we were working with a business. So they don't like leave that to chance. Yeah. You know, they're like, okay, here's how we applied it in a real setting. Um, so I've used some of those concepts that they talk about, like they talk about um, how you need to um, divide out leadership. So don't try to do everything yourself. Yeah. Like, uh, make sure like, here's your, a student maybe helping you give them, here's what I want. And then let them kind of figure it out. Yeah. Cause then that, that might help you. You might find about a better way to do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But just that general concept of, you know, this is everything starts and stops with you. And if something didn't go the way you want, and the great thing about the book is they start with what, what happened that was bad. Yeah. They didn't start with their successes. They start with, this was a big mistake that I made. And he talks about Jocko. One of the authors talks about the post operation meeting with that. And he, and he asked his group, whose fault was this? You know, and everyone's like, uh, you know, this, this was my fault. It was, it was their fault. And he kept asking the question and, and at first, eventually everyone stopped answering because they didn't have any answers left. And Jocko was like, nope, my fault. I didn't make this clear enough. I didn't make that clear enough. This was my fault. That was my fault. And then nobody blamed anybody. Because yeah. everyone started thinking, oh, no, you know what? That was my fault. That was my fault. So it, it eliminates blaming other people. Yeah. So then you can start to, okay, let's figure out a solution. So that, that was one. Highly recommend that to anyone. I know that's become pretty popular recently. Yeah. But that was one, one that as soon as I heard about it, I immediately uh, got on that. Um, Plus, so it's, fun to follow, it's fun to follow Jocko on Twitter and see what time, oh, he, yeah. <laughs> what time he wakes up every morning and try to beat him sometimes. So. Yeah, his pod, his pod, he has a podcast too. And that is definitely not for everybody. But I would recommend the book for anybody. Okay. Absolutely anybody. Um, so that's like a recent one. Uh, and then another one that has been a part of my, I guess, DNA as a coach and a person for a really long time has, uh, 
make the big time where you are by frosty westering i think i think a lot of coaches know that one uh but luckily i had to read that in high school like if you wanted to be a, a senior football player on our team in high school you had to read this book so it it, it really has just impacted me in it's similar to extreme ownership where your mindset has to be wherever you're at, be the best version of whatever that is, no matter what. Yeah. You know, I think Frosty in that book tells a story about he's in some random restaurant in, I, I don't know where he wasn't in the city, but the, the meal he had was just so good. And so he had to talk to the chef, right? And personally thank the chef. And the chef was like, you know, I just try to do the best I can. With, with what I'm doing. Yeah. Whether that's flipping eggs or bacon or whatever, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, make the big time. Treat it as if it is a big deal because yeah. it is a big deal to to the people around you. Exactly. So that that was one that that uh, again I'd recommend. And that luckily I had to read that very early on. Yeah. And I think you'd agree that the small smaller coaches at smaller schools, like that's a big mindset. Thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so that's that would be the second one. Uh, and then the third one is again a little more recent. Uh, it's a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Uh, and that um, book is about passion and maybe how follow your passion isn't the greatest advice. And uh, and that's, I'm not gonna, I don't know if I'm going to get into that <laughs> yeah. because he, he spends the whole book unpacking that. But what really struck me about that book is this concept of having a craftsman mindset and seeing your work as being a craftsman, like a craftsman will study for years and years and maybe even be an apprentice. Yep. Okay. Before he, he's even considered as being out on his own. Yeah like this artist yep. path of what you do. And so Cal talks a lot about having that mindset no matter what your job is. So that, that uh, guy who was flipping Frosty's eggs in that restaurant, he saw his job as a craftsman. Yeah. How good can I be at making over easy eggs yep. or scrambled eggs or whatever? Uh, I think and this is a trap I've somewhat fallen into, you know, we all want to get like rush and get to the end of our careers a little bit where we feel like we have things figured out or maybe we have notoriety or people know who we are kind of thing, you know, whatever that is. And you forget that the people you see who are that way, like they had to go through this already. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and he talks about this concept of also building career capital. And that is develop a skill set. Like, so his capital is developing skills. Don't, don't expect it to, to make the whatever you think the big time is without having a ton of career capital built up. And that, and that again, goes back to the craftsman. Like, whatever, whatever situation or job that you're in, what skills are you building? Are you building your skills? Because at any point, at any job that you get have or any point in time, you can be building some type of skill. Yeah. And so focus on that. Don't focus on what can I do next? What's down the road? What's on the other side? Uh, I just, that really kind of made me slow down a little bit and like, okay, I'm still a baby in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a baby in the profession. Let's just, let's focus on being as best as I can be or doing the best job that I can where I'm at, build some career capital, be a craftsman, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something, you know, with me, my main job being in, in the private sector, got a lot of interns and whatnot, and for our staff meeting and stuff, they'll, they'll ask all the time, you know, you know how, how do you build like a, like a national brand, like a Cressy or a Robertson? Mm -hmm. And I would start with them, you know, that stuff, while it's fine and dandy, you worry about being like the expert in your area. Yes. And, and yeah. so the athletes or the people paying you, how you're, you know, making your income, making ends meet. Those people are the ones that have to build trust in you. 
have to believe you that are the expert rather than trying to build a website or yep. a national notoriety or whatever it may be. Is right. don't worry about that stuff. If, like you said, if you're good where you're at and you can make the big time, people will notice eventually down the road. But your goal should be the localized expert and go to yeah. the person. Don't worry about trying to be, you know, that someone retweets your article or whatnot, you know, be the greatest we can be at where you're at. Um, and that's great advice. That's you know, all those books kind of kind of reiterate that a little bit. Yeah. I kind of know when I put that list together, that's kind of like, huh, those are a lot of the same. <laughs> yeah. I, I've read the first two. Um, so good. Uh, they can't ignore you. I haven't read that one yet, but that's on my list. I'm going to definitely get to that. Yeah, I checked that one. I have even thought about making that one required reading for my, for our sophomore year practicum students. Okay. Just to like make sure like they understand. And this can be applied to any profession, not just strength conditioning. Right. Yeah. But just get that mind in their mind right away. Yeah. Like don't rush it. This is your time as a student to research and research and dive into it. And since you're now, uh, you know, we have an academic program for strength and conditioning. So if they, that's what they want to do, they will spend the next three years with us on the floor coaching. That's awesome. So that is again, time to time to be a craftsman. Exactly. Yeah. Okay? And, and, and absorb it and immerse yourself in it, you know, and still be a college student, right? Yeah. Still be a college student. But I have almost thought about putting that as required reading to put, to expose them to that craftsman mindset right away. Um, it's, I definitely would recommend that this that one as well. Good. Good. Next up, you know, what are some of your favorite websites or blogs or, you know, anything along those lines that you recommend coaches go to check out? What are some great things that you like to keep tabs on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, honestly, man, I don't have a ton of websites that I just like have bookmarked. Yep. And I visit on a regular basis because social media has, has progressed to the point where we can get a lot of that via, you know, what other people share. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I think I'm sure you're the same way. If you go my if you look at my Twitter feed and my Twitter yeah. followers, it is like literally every other one is either strength and conditioning or someone's posting research or an article. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are some that I, if they put something out, I'm reading it. Yeah. Right. So precision nutrition would be my first one. Yep. I mean, I'm a nutrition guy. That, that's kind of um, where I've spent a lot of my time throughout college and grad school reading. Uh, and I think, you know, most coaches are semi familiar with that. So precision nutrition, if they write, a new article. I'm reading that. Uh, one that I would maybe suggest beyond precision nutrition is the Alan Aragon research review. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's a paid subscription. So it's not something that you could just get for free, but it's super cheap. Uh, every issue, you know, it has stuff that we are interested in as strength coaches. It has a performance focus. So he's, he's, re he's reviewing some research, but it's all like more digestible. It's not like reading a scientific paper necessarily, but what he's done also that I think is really cool is he does have a lot of training in there. Okay. Like guys like Eric Helms are writing for them or uh, Jason Tremblay, who is uh, he, he's worked for the strength guys, which I would you know, highly recommend anybody follow. Like they are writing articles on periodization, auto regulatory training, all that kind of stuff that I think is really valuable. So Aaron, Alan, Alan, Alan Aragon research review, 10 bucks a month. Yep. I think it's very worthwhile. Um, the other guys that if they put something out, I'm reading, uh, Dean Somerset. Yep. I love his stuff. He's the one who really opened my eyes to, uh, hip anatomy, like differences in people's hip anatomy and how that can affect the way they move. Uh, if Eric Cressy posts something, I'm reading it. If uh, and the other guy would be Quinn Hennick. Yeah. Uh, now he doesn't do a lot of writing, but he does a he has a tons of YouTube videos. Yeah. And I almost see YouTube channels anymore as my blogs. Yeah. That I go to. I I found that I would much rather consume information via watching it than than reading, especially articles. Like books are a little different, but 
I would much rather watch a 50 minute lecture <laughs> yep. than, than read a big long article. So I'm a big YouTube consumer. Uh, I'll go to the NSCA yep. uh, video library, which Bad is people. really yeah. good. Like yeah. they've really uh, done a great job with that. Yeah. You can find a ton of good stuff on, on that. And, and so past presentations at their, their conference. Oh yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. It's good stuff. Um, so those are maybe the, the websites that I'll, or blogs that I'll uh, you know, frequently visit or check on or websites that I would recommend. Okay. Yeah. How about how, any apps you're using in the weight room or any apps you know, that you play around with? Yeah, you know, not a ton. That's not something I've delved into a lot from a weight room perspective. Like, you know, you have Coach's Eye yep. or you'll have um, just general slow-mo yeah. capture. I actually found that that worked better than any cue that I could give an athlete when we were doing speed training, just videotape. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like that's what I kind of found was I can make way more headway, way faster, just videotaping a person in slow motion. And that way they see them, what they're doing, maybe incorrectly. I'll just show them what they're doing. And almost every single time their next rep was better. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, sometimes I honestly forget about it Yeah, be honest, because yeah. That, when, you know, when I was, maybe you were the same, I don't know, but when I was coming up through school, well, we, one, we didn't have the option, Yep. but cell phones were like not allowed no. at yeah. all. <laughs> not a chance. So, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to use the technology that I have available to me to make the athlete better. And so from that perspective, um, that's really all I'm doing as far as on the floor. Uh, and we have free lap timing system. Okay. So that free lap app will also, I'll use for like just general speech. Like we did flying tens this summer, like similar to you. Yep. Uh, we didn't do the, the drop off system, but just, just general timing. Yeah. Free lap uh, for that. Awesome. That's good stuff. Yep. Last one. You know, what was what your favorite social media outlets that you like to use, browse or connect with other coaches with? Um, so for browsing and connecting, uh, probably Facebook. Uh, I like Facebook a lot because I mean, honestly, if you looked at my Facebook and Twitter feeds, they're almost very, <laughs> they're very similar, just like the same people. I tend to use them both more professionally than personally. Oh yeah. So I, I don't really use, I mean, Facebook, sometimes I'll use personally. Uh, meaning non-training, non-strength and conditioning stuff, but Twitter is almost 100% uh, professional. Uh, but I like Facebook. I like uh, seeing what other people post, but I like that I can interact a little more than Twitter. Yeah. So I kind of mentioned earlier with sending somebody a message or writing on a Facebook wall. I, I try not to just add people anymore just for the sake of adding. If someone, if I add someone as a friend, then I want to have a reason for it. Yep. And so I'll use that as if they add me, I'll send them either a, a, right on their wall or a Facebook message, similar to what I described earlier with my students. Yep. Uh, I, I like that aspect. And that's, <laughs> that's gotta be quite a few connections that I probably never would have. I bet. Yeah. Otherwise. Uh, so I like Facebook for that reason. I like Twitter. For I almost that's where I tweet my podcasts. Yep. Anything I'm listening to, if you go through or scroll through my old Twitter feed, yep. That's all the stuff I'm listening to. But as far as interaction goes, it's it's very limited. Yep. Obviously, and then Instagram, I like Instagram just because I do like to see what other coaches are doing. I, you know, you can only do so much with that, especially yeah. when you're trying to learn from another coach. But I like Instagram for my athletes. Yep. That's where I get to post and give them a little bit of just a like kind of like a shout out. Yeah. Hey, here's so and so doing this. Yeah. And what athlete doesn't like to see themselves on Instagram? Yeah. Or or something or Facebook or YouTube or something like that. It's not so much. Hey, look at what I'm doing, or hey, look at what we're doing at Northwestern. Yeah. Well, like yes, I'll still post maybe something I think is unique that we're doing from just a school. Uh, getting them some exposure, but you know, it's for the athlete. They like it. They love it. Yeah. You know, the, when I first started doing it, 
I would have other athletes and teams. Hey, when am I going to get on Instagram? Yeah. How come you don't take videos of us? And these are, these are maybe a team that I didn't think cared, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait, you care about that? I mean, yeah. I didn't think you'd even care at all. And that just was the way that I kind of initially started to build buy-in maybe and just a little pride in what we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I, what I like for, for the use of Instagram. Yeah. I'll bring out the camera. And I'll be, you know, filming and somebody like, is this going on Instagram? I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. Like, all of a sudden, they just like, turn, turn it yeah. on. <laughs> so now there's a chance you go on Instagram, you're going to go way harder now or, you know, something like that. It's, yeah. It's funny, yeah. But for connecting with other coaches, I like Facebook. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Well, Corey, that's, you know, all the questions I had for you today, man. It was, this is good stuff. I got a, a page full of notes here. Good. <laughs> Make sure to. Uh, you know, link your Twitter, Instagram, Facebook accounts and usernames um, on our show notes. But uh, man, I can't, I can't thank you enough. I appreciate it. It was good stuff. Dude, yeah. It was, it was great to be on here with you, man. I, I appreciate you asking me to be on and yeah, I have anyone can reach out to me on, on all those uh, media outlets. Um, my email, if people want to reach out to me, Corey.VanWyke at gmail.com. And then if you want to do my, my, uh, school email it's the same corey.vanwyk uh, at nwciowa.edu if people want to reach out that way too Good. i'm always willing to um skype chat with people I, I i love that i love connecting and talking shop that way um so don't yeah feel free to reach out i'd love to connect awesome well Corey, thanks a lot man all right thanks mike please join me in thanking Corey for taking the time and sharing his insight into his current job and what he goes into his day-to-day -day work um, as always please give us a follow on twitter or instagram or facebook at bba performance or at building better athletes and like share this with anybody that you think would uh, have some key takeaways from what Corey shared today thank you and we'll see you next time on the elite performance podcast